Hello and welcome to Fit to Speak. I'm Eugene Irma. So glad to have you with us. Spring is here, the lockdowns of two years ago are gone, and Tom Brady did not stay gone from the NFL for long. Maybe it's because of those gas prices, who knows? One thing's for sure, it's not going to be a summer of love between these two if the Oscars were any indication. And this fall, we can look forward to Joe Buck, half of the dynamic announcing duo, saying on ESPN, Pass is caught! But today, we continue to talk about the fumbles not too long ago of gossip vlogger Tasha Kay and podcast host Joe Rogan with journalist by Magazine senior editor Keith Murphy. We've got quite a bit to get to, so let's begin. But first, as we end March, just this past Friday, Black News Channel shut its doors this after filing for bankruptcy and on the heels of its highest ratings yet for Judge Kataji Brown Jackson's confirmation hearings. Shahid Khan, the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars franchise of the NFL, who invested $50 million into the network, was no longer willing to put up more money in the BNC not making payroll. And just last month, the National Association of Black Journalists, and in the interest of disclosure, I am a member, met with the leadership of the network to address allegations of gender discrimination, a hostile work environment, and pay inequities. President and CEO Pencil Hare stated in part in a letter to his more than 230 employees who are now out of work, quote, During the past few months, we've endured very painful workforce reductions at all levels of the network as we worked to achieve our financial goal of a break-even business. This has forced all of you to do more with less, and your contributions have been remarkable. Unfortunately, due to challenging market conditions and global financial pressures, we've been unable to meet our financial goals, and the timeline afforded to us has run out. It's with a broken heart that I'm letting you all know that, effective immediately, BNC will cease live production and file for bankruptcy. We are saddened and disappointed by this reality and recognize the stress that this puts on you and your families. This stress was certainly laid bare by Mark Lamont Hill, who was a host on the network, stating in a tweet on the 26th of this month that him and his former colleagues would have no sufferance and, by now, as you're seeing this program, no health insurance. This is just one of two dramatic shifts that have occurred in the media landscape this month. The only thing constant in this business is change, and in the coming days on our Instagram page, we are at CSE underscore media. I will have an IGTV exclusive in which I'll tell you about the one video that you must watch that fully explains the factors that led to the demise of BNC. And while you're there, be sure to also watch my take on the slap heard around the world at this year's Oscars, in which Will Smith has since apologized to Chris Rock in an Instagram post stating in part, quote, I am a work in progress. The thing that is fascinating to me, Oprah, is that, you know, we are now uh, in the aura yeah. of the celebration of Martin Luther King. And for those of us who have, you know, uh, moved some Laura. length yeah. of that that long road with yeah. king yes it's a time for reflection looking back looking forward mm -hmm. asking ourselves how have we done and what do we hope to do right the thing that is intriguing to me is that king fought the old racism mm -hmm. and there are an entire generation of black americans who believe that because the old racism has been set to rest that there is no racism there is a whole generation of black Americans who do not understand that there is a new racism. And the new racism is what this gentleman, this gentleman, this gentleman, this gentleman have just stood up and articulated. The new racism is what you see when your quote unquote good white friend yeah. says, what was he doing in the neighborhood? I was doing in the neighborhood exactly what she was doing in the neighborhood. That is the new racism. That's the designer that? racism. Last month, I introduced you to civil rights activist Edward C. Lawson. If you want to have more of a primer on how he came to be, do revisit that episode right here on this YouTube channel. Of course, we'll have a link to that in the description below. I want to continue to share with you his brilliance and prescience. What he just said on Oprah about the aura of Martin Luther King reminded me, and keep in mind, by the way, this aired only a few years after Martin Luther King Day was first signed into law by former U.S. President Ronald Reagan, who, by the way, didn't want it to begin with, it reminded me about the aura of another uh, figure, another uh, man, that is former U.S. President Barack Obama. I remember all the articles and pontification about how the United States had become a post-racial society because at that point a black man was in the White House. 
And don't get it twisted, it was a remarkable achievement and full disclosure, I was there for his first inauguration in the bitter cold. And it just so happened to be the first time I took Metro, which by the way, with the gas prices now, you would think that this would be Metro's time to shine. Uh, but the 7,000 series trains, wherever they are, tell a different tale. Anyway, we still have a long, long way to go, folks. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Remember Amy Cooper, who fought that Christian Cooper, no relation, a bird watcher who just so happened to be black, was so scary that she called the police on him. Now, this happened in 2020. In 1987? Hi, Oprah. Hi. Um, what I'm calling about to say is, I don't think I'm prejudiced, but if I would get on a bus and this gentleman, the first gentleman with the hair, would sit next to me, the Edward. way he's dressed, no, no, he's no Mr. you, <laughs> Mr. King. Um, I would grab my purse and probably move to another seat. It's because of his looks. It's scary. Note the word scary. Now, when Edward asked her to define it, this happened. Oh, gee, I don't know. Uh, well, now would be a very good time to figure it out. Well, what does the word scary mean? That is my question. Well, you would frighten me. The, I understand that. General. What does the word scary mean? Or, same question, why would I frighten you? I haven't been in a fight well, since I was in I eighth think, grade. Well, you're probably not normally dressed up in a suit. Um, you just look like your tough guy. If she went to you Jamaica, see, if she went to Jamaica, she'd be frightened all the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, well, madam, let me then answer the question. So, what is it? Is it because of the, because of the way he's dressed, the color of his skin, or his hair? Is it his hair? Yes. Yes. So, and I'm sure he's not always dressed in a suit. I, I don't know whether or not to laugh or cry at the fact that the reasoning that some people have has not changed in four decades. Again. The more things change, the more they stay the same. And going back to the concept that Edward had about old racism versus new racism, he defines the latter to the caller who believed that Edward was scary. Now, I do want to warn you that Edward does use the Edward in the clip that I'm, that I'm about to play for you, but I think that it's important that we leave this stuff uncensored. Uh, because of the context in which it's used. I speak of the old racism, which was pre-Dr. Doctor, uh, Doctor Martin Luther King. I didn't speak of the new racism. One of the things you have to understand about racists or about yourself is racists are inherently intellectual cowards. They won't come out and say, I hate niggers because I hate niggers. Story over. What they will do is take pseudo-facts. They will take facts that are not true and use that as the intellectual pyramid to come to a conclusion that is inaccurate. If you actually want to talk about the statistics, if you are afraid of me on that bus, I don't ride on buses, because you think I'm going to murder you, there is no statistical basis for that. You are more likely to be murdered by your husband, by your son, by your brother. If you are afraid of me sitting next to you on that bus that I don't ride on, because you are afraid that I'm going to rape you, statistically, your boyfriend, your husband, is more probably going to be the rapist. So I'm saying you are the manifestation of the new racism, and you have used the same pseudo-intellectual statistics to construct a racist position. Thank you, caller. I'm sure you didn't know you did all that with one phone call. <laughs> but Oprah, she did indeed. And that's not all. Edward correctly predicted the role of voting, and, you know, voter participation, that is, and money in our elections. Granted, there may be more legislation on the book that makes it possible for more people to participate in elections. But at the same time that the legislature hands you that, then, particularly in terms of Mr. Meese, the Justice Department is simply taking the guts out of the ability of the Justice Department to enforce those kind of laws. At the same time, you may have paper freedom, paper liberty being handed to you by the legislature on the one hand with more legislation supporting uh, voting. On the other hand, you have a structure whereby Madison Avenue, or I guess out here, Beverly Hills, mandates that you have to have more money than the average American could count on his finger, toes, and anything else in order to run for any office. And the role of the media in informing the public. I think that to a large part, the highest accolade in reducing public apathy, which uh, I think is epidemic at this point, is uh, 
people who do work like yourselves, like the Donahues, like the Winfrey's, like the Bryant Gumbles. I think that this kind of electronic uh, media is sort of the uh, town meeting of the 21st century. It's sort of the hanging out in front of the uh, old general store in which ideas can be both uh, proposed and examined. I think that's very important. The town square where ideas can be proposed and examined, he's right. And the more things change, the more they stay the same. And the ideas that Edward presents and passed along in all of his appearances are based on common sense. We need to hear more from people like Edward. Sadly, Edward C. Lawson is no longer with us. He died May 12th, 2011 of pancreatic cancer. And you know, when I think about some of the activism today, some of it is just nothing more than performance. Black squares, hashtags, all kinds of things. It all gives the appearance of doing something, you know, making people feel good without doing anything, really. I have much more respect for those like Edward who actually put in the work to make the world a much better place. Those who also have put their bodies on the line to help make this world a better place. Edward's contributions to our society and in life will be remembered forever. There is no question about that. And while there is still a lot of work to be done, he left our world a much better place than when he arrived. I hope that all of you watching this program will never forget Edward C. Lawson. He deserves to be in the books of Black history and really American history as far as I'm concerned. He will not be silenced. edition of the program, we enumerated the controversies surrounding Joe Rogan and Natasha Kay, the latter of whom had to pay Cardi B $4 million. While those stories disappeared from the news cycle, and rightly so given Russian President Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine, there is utility in the advice that Keith Murphy had for both content creators. I would tell Rogan and Natasha Kay, well, don't be a grifter. You know, like, don't grift. Uh, if you follow Rogan's videos from a few years ago. He was a fairly, you know, left-centered, mm -hmm. you know, a little bit, not even left-centered. He was, he was kind of like on a fringe, but he was, he was a left fringe type of person, right? Yeah. Who yeah. believed in vaccines and believed, you know, he was, he was a Bernie supporter, but he wasn't, you know, wildly out there saying anything that was just 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 you know beyond the pill right right and once he saw that he started entertaining you know these far right right extremists uh racist you know just straight up racist extremists you know coming on the show talking about you know black folks having a violent gene and you know uh hosting proud boys on there and he saw that his fan base grew and he saw that in order for him to keep that fan base he had to have some sort of eye wink towards that fan base so what you're saying now is is a grift he's grifting uh tasha k it's a little different i wouldn't really consider her just so much grifting oh. i just think oh. that she's was caught up in the infamy of social media, thinking that nothing was going to touch her because once you put it out in the ether, that's it, right? Nothing happens to you. Mm -hmm. But she found out that certain people take that stuff seriously. So for Rogan, he's a grifter. Kids, don't be a grifter. Uh, Tosh K, get fact check, fact check it. Get somebody on your team, even if you have a small, small podcast. And, small show and you're not really you know you're not really going you know too seriously uh on the youtube and outlets like that have somebody on your side to say hey that may not be a good idea to do that we can get sued 
journalists indeed have a certain responsibility to share information, disseminate information, factual information, that is, and do so in good faith. And there are a lot of folks out there that are doing a good job. If we go back even further, you may recall that there was a law on the books at one point that required those stations that held FCC licenses to do just that. And I'm going to be speaking with Keith Murphy about that in a few minutes. But first, I asked him about trust in the media and whether or not for some it can be regained. And to further drive this point home, I'm going to start the final part of this interview with an excerpt from this Pew Research Center video. The challenges that Americans are facing parsing through the news online is in this new environment of misinformation. The large share of Americans saying that made up news creates confusion and it, it's really a big problem for society. It's true that social media now has added an extra layer of complexity to the issues that news consumers and news producers are grappling with. And it almost gets back to the very foundational question. We ask, do you trust the news media? And a lot of people answer no to that question. But then to unpack that idea, and Americans are equally comfortable sort of saying, yes, I really like and I really trust some sources, but not others. And so in a way, their trust has become disaggregated and divided. Well, I don't think there's a way to regain it. I think once, I believe, I believe, the, is it the FAIR doctrine? Yeah, the FAIRness yeah, doctrine, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I believe once that got thrown to the wayside, all hell broke loose. Once that happened, you know, Rush Limbaugh went, you know, just just took over. And he became the template of how you do these things. You don't necessarily have to take the truth. Uh, you can be a demagogue. You can say the most racially racist, repugnant stuff, right? You can lie if you cloak yourself in, well, I'm not lying about this person specifically. I'm just giving a point of, a different point of view of this subject matter, right? Yeah. Which is yeah. Rogan doing his vaccine thing. I'm just giving another view of it. No, your view is, 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 is false, right? But it doesn't matter because he's cloaking himself into that, right? So mm -hmm. ever, ever since the, the Fair Doctrine just went, just went under, um, now you have, you know, and, and, I, and, I, and I believe, you know, there, there's some left, left you know, uh, sided um, outlets that are, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, taking advantage of that, but mostly, mostly it's 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 right wing. Everything's a grift. Everything is how can I rile up, you know, our viewers, our listeners, right? And so Rogan is just just he just hopped on that train. All of the money. I mean, it's, it's brazen though, because like I said, he, he was totally different, and, and as far as the the N-word thing, you know, that's just the whole bro, white bro culture thing, just wearing his ugly head again, you know. Hey, listen, I if I saw Joe Rogan on the street, I wouldn't have anything to say with him because I, I think he's I think he's a joke. Um, I think that he's uh hiding behind BS. And I think he's just a charlatan grifter, right? Mm -hmm. He's pop and you have to that seriously. So Unless we have new legislation that says you're just not allowed to straight up lie about stuff, right? Or, or if you give one opinion, you got to give the other opinion. That's right. right. That's right. Right. So that's that's what needs to happen. Beyond that, there's no saving it. That was Keith Murphy, the senior editor of Vi Magazine. We thank him for joining us on the program, and in case you missed the first part of our conversation with Keith or just want to relive it, be sure to check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the CSC channel for the February edition of the program, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. Folks, we continue to need your help in finding broadcast industry professional and University of Maryland alum Terrence Woods, who's been missing since October of 2018. 
If you have any information as to Terrence's whereabouts, you're asked to call the Idaho County Sheriff's Office at 208-983-1100. That's 208-983-1100. You can also reach out to us on our social media accounts, which you'll see at the end of the program, and we'll pass any information along to them. Finally, the University of Maryland recently hired Kevin Willard as the next men's basketball coach. Maryland certainly didn't have to wait too long given Seton Hall's early exit from March Madness. Well, at least Seton Hall was in the tournament, unlike the men of Maryland this year. But I did watch the presser with great interest, and it was this portion that made me believe that this guy gets the high expectations that this area has got for the program. We are going to work every day. No one's going to outwork us. No one's going to grind us more. Uh, we have unbelievable support. It's an unbelievable university. I've been here. I've walked around. Uh, my promise to you is no one will outwork me. It just won't happen. No one's going to outwork my teams. They might have a better zone offense, and if you ask the Seton Hall fans, they will tell you everybody has a better zone offense than me. But I will work every day. My staff will work every day. We are going to have fun. We are going to bring the swag back to Maryland basketball, and we are going to win at a high level. And I promise you that. Thank you for this opportunity. I will not let you down. Go Terps. Oh, that was some fire right there, folks. That was some real fire right there. And that was more than what I saw, especially towards the end, from Mark Turgeon. And ultimately, talk is cheap. Actions speak louder than words. And when you win, you've got friends. 17,950 of them, at least, over at Xfinity Center. So I do wish Kevin Willard the absolute best of luck. And I do look forward to seeing how he does come this fall. And thank you so much for watching. Listen, there's going to be a lot more where that came from, so you better stay tuned to catch it all. In the meantime, don't forget to follow us on all of our social media accounts for more information, including all of the bonus content that you'll see from today's show. And don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell on our YouTube channel so that you do not miss any of our episodes. And until next time, I'm Eugene Oba, and remember, we will not be silenced.